So it's a great pleasure, of course, to introduce today's speaker, Scott Edwards, um, second of our invitees for the, um, the director search. Scott and I go back away. I can't tell too many embarrassing stories about him because he has the last word, of course. <laughs> but I do recall when he was looking to start grad school, he was tossing up between two places, at least I know of. One was Michigan with Wes Brown, the other was Berkeley with um, uh, Alan Wilson and also with um, Ned Johnson here in the museum. Of course, at the time I was a postdoc in Michigan, and I think Scott turned up, it was probably winter, I'm not sure what. And it was I was trying to convince him what a great, exciting, vibrant place Michigan was in winter. <laughs> he chose Berkeley, and from there on has gone on to do truly great and wonderful things. He's the Alexander Agassi Professor at, at Harvard. Prior to that, he was at uh, what, uh, University of Washington. Um, a long and illustrious career. Uh, you heard a lot about that yesterday. I won't take up more time now. Scott, it's great to have you back in the museum. Uh, and today is telling us about bringing together museums, genomes, and geography. Thank you very much, Craig. It's uh, great to be here again. Uh, if there's any doubt as to whether you've uh, worn me into the ground, uh, the answer is yes. Uh, but it's been a thoroughly enjoyable visit. I've uh, learned a lot about uh, the new IB and the new MBZ, and so it's uh, very exciting to be here. Uh, what I thought I'd do today is uh, sort of go on a, a bit of an intellectual reverie about uh, the place of museums in the era of genomics and uh, how museums can position themselves so as to uh, be of the most service to the uh, wider scientific community and potentially to uh, inform uh, genomics itself. Now, in coming up with this title, the bottom line is that uh, I will talk about these three things, but I mostly chose geography because it sounded good. Um, sure, I'll talk about museums, genomics, and geography, but um, as uh, I hope to convince you, genomics has, uh, if we consider it a foundation, perhaps, of modern zoology, uh, genomics, I think, has something to offer many, many different fields of broad interest to the Berkeley community and to the international community. We can think about uh, genomes, museums, and pathogens, for example. As I talked about on Monday, uh, I've been using genomics approaches to understand the evolution of a novel host-pathogen interaction. And uh, goodness knows what information about uh, ancestral pathogen spreads there are in collections such as those here at the MBZ. We can think about genomics and climate change. And uh, the initiatives that I've seen here on campus are very exciting insofar as they're uh, forcing us to think of creative ways in which to integrate genomics into questions of broad concern for society and for the campus here. We can think of genomics and fields perhaps that are at the core of the modern <coughs> museum mission, fields such as systematics. And all of these fields, I think, can play off the extraordinary power that genomics can offer. And my vision is one in which genomics certainly plays a foundational role, but it's not one in which genomics dominates. We are in a phase now where we are in awe of and are bewildered by often the uh, extraordinary size of data sets we can generate. Uh, I believe we're in a transition time and that the time will come soon whereby we can uh, streamline these processes and begin to think of the broader questions, the broader impacts, what sort of specimens will be required to answer the really exciting questions. And so I see um, uh, the next few years of, of the MBZ and, and, and many other museums as working through this transition period and looking forward to a day when we can play off the strengths that museum collections have to offer. Because the bottom line is the exciting questions are not going to be determined by genomics per se. Whole genomes are here. They're here now. And what's going to influence the exciting questions are the creativity of the questions and access to the samples, the historical samples. And it will be places like the MBZ and other museums that can really leverage these resources that are simply not at other institutions. 
So we'll talk a little bit about the, just reflections. I'll talk to you a little bit about my conception of collections as archives of environmental history. Uh, the idea that uh, a specimen tied to a particular place and time is a record in many, many different ways, not just a genetic record, a phenotypic record, a chemical record, a behavioral record uh, that we can then compare with uh, modern uh, samples. In the middle, I'll talk about uh, three major areas of research that I'm <coughs> excited about now, which all play off uh, specimens in one way or another. We'll talk about phylogeography and how it is changing and how genomics is transforming that science. I want to talk a little bit about this uh, topic called association mapping. This is essentially trying to find genes that underlie variation in phenotypic traits. Although association mapping sounds somewhat foreign and perhaps intimidating to uh, us, I suspect it's what many of us are working towards right now. And in fact, it's being done in model species such as Arabidopsis and Drosophila. I think we're very close to uh, being able to launch into the era of association mapping in species for which we don't have genomes uh, today. Finally, I'll talk about transcriptomics and some of our work trying to look at variation um, of uh, the gene expression landscape across geography and to use transcriptomics as a tool to find genes under natural selection. Because one of my uh, thoughts about what a place like the MBZ could do with its incredible uh, uh, enthusiasm for field research is to begin to build targeted collections that could be the foundation for studies of gene expression research. Uh, using gene expression as another dimension of the phenotype that we can correlate with changing uh, landscapes and habitats. And then I'll just end briefly by uh, trying to illustrate my commitment to building bridges uh, not only within the scientific community, but between the museum community and the broader uh, public. <clears throat> so I'll open with uh, a slide and a species near and dear to my heart, uh, illustrating yet another uh, way in which museums can contribute to uh, exciting questions. This is, of course, the work of uh, your uh, graduate student, Elaine Vo, who was an undergrad with me at Harvard. Um, I wish I had had a video camera outside of Elaine's office on the day this paper was accepted because I <laughs> expect she was just trotting down the aisles uh, uh, with a huge smile on her face. It was a wonderful piece of work in which we tried to look at, use um, century-old uh, museum specimens of this uh, iconic species, the black-footed albatross, to study the change in mercury levels over time. This had been done for uh, other species primarily in the Atlantic Basin, this was the first uh, sort of top predator in which it was looked at in the Pacific Basin. And what Elaine showed so beautifully was the very steady increase in organic mercury over time using specimens dating from the 1880s to uh, the 2000s. What you can see in this gray line here is the levels that one would have detected had one measured total mercury, which of course consists of both the organic and the inorganic. The challenge, and perhaps the reason why the field has focused so much on the inorganic fraction or the total fraction, is because it's cheaper. It's much, much easier and cheaper to measure total mercury than to focus specifically on the organic fraction. And so this was a really uh, remarkably uh, clean demonstration of the effects of increasing emissions, presumably from Asia, that are driving up the uh, uh, mercury being taken up in the feathers from which this mercury was uh, measured. She also showed very nicely, I think, the way in which we can use targeted uh, species and collections to demonstrate uh, the changes in uh, curatorial practices. And so here are two species, the uh, Altamira oriole and the russet crown motmot, which we chose as species that were unlikely to have been affected strongly by organic mercury emissions, living as they do in inland forested areas in Central America. And Elaine showed clearly that the levels of uh, total mercury uh, and uh, the uh, levels of total mercury had been declining over time, most likely indicating the change in practices of curators. And of course, one has to tease this out uh, if one is to make statements about the uh, total uh, organic mercury that one's looking at. These black dots are the black footed albatross uh, samples for this, and the O's and M's are simply our sort of control species by which we confirmed this decline in uh, uh, curator-mediated mercury on the specimens. And so it's a really, uh, I think this illustrates my conception of specimens as 
uh, archives of environmental history uh, as points, snapshots in time whereby we can measure, in this case, not only mercury, but um, stable isotopes as well to get an index of how these birds might be changing their feeding habits. In my research, I've used uh, genomics and behavior. And this is a project that I won't talk about much today, except to say that it's a, a really uh, fun collaboration with a woman named Gabby Nevitt at UC Davis, who is a chemical ecologist. And uh, we are both interested in whether this bird, the leech's storm petrel, can use its extraordinary olfactory sense to perhaps choose mates uh, and to form long-term pair bonds. This is the field station where we work in uh, a small island off the southern tip of Nova Scotia. And these are uh, a pair of uh, very enthusiastic undergraduates. This is a great project, I think, for uh, uh, students interested in natural history and field biology. Uh, it's a non-destructive project, but it's one in which we're combining behavior with um, very cutting-edge genomic techniques. We're very interested in the olfactory gene repertoire of the species. We're beginning a, a genome project to look at what I think is going to be a fascinating view into a species which has a really extraordinary biology, uh, foraging at the open ocean, primarily during the day, returning to its burrows at night. It has um, a really novel uh, olfactory bulb, and its uh, incubation period, for example, the chicks uh, being uh, hatched in the burrows will incubate in an egg for 45 days. Think of this, this is a bird about the same size as an American robin, which would hatch from its egg in about two weeks. So there's a really interesting uh, story about development and the acquisition of these sensory abilities, which I think the genome will uh, tell us a lot of cool things about. Now, we're used to thinking of genomics as sort of calling the shots, uh, telling uh, the community uh, how they need to march in line and uh, get their act together. But it's worth asking, what, do, what can museums tell genomics? And I think museums can make important contribution, contributions to the practice of genomics simply through their uh, detailed archiving, detailed data acquisition, databasing, such as is done uh, here so wonderfully, the biodiversity and the phylogenetic knowledge that accompanies genome projects is, can't be underestimated. Um, some of you, and certainly myself, are participating in sort of very large team uh, multi-genome projects some of which could be driven by a better uh, awareness and understanding of phylogenetic diversity. One always has priorities when one is designing these multi-million dollar projects. Sometimes the priority is to study um, a particular uh, organismal attribute, such as the origin of vocal learning, as we're doing with a, a multi-songbird uh, genome project. But that project might not have the same collection of species as one that is geared toward uh, an understanding of the origins of phylogenetic diversity, or perhaps biogeography. And so uh, bringing to the table the phylogenetic knowledge and knowledge of diversity is something that museum scientists can really play an important role in. <clears throat> of course, we've got uh, species are not typological. They belong to a geographic context. And this is, of course, uh, something that we can add to genomics immeasurably. Right now, we see the thousand Human Genomes Project, in which they're sequencing many genomes of humans across the globe. This is going to be the case for many species, and will be the ones that will be able to intelligently inform the sampling of those individuals so as to best uh, milk the, uh, the resulting information. And of course, the links with the rest of biology. Again, I believe that uh, although we feel like we're in the trenches now, what with genomic science, we'll soon have a streamlined situation such that we can return to uh, thinking clearly about what are the important questions to ask. And so, for example, the Genome 10K project, which some of you here, I know Jim is, is involved with, uh, is a very ambitious project uh, to sequence the genomes of 10,000 vertebrates. Um, I still think it's somewhat ambitious. I'm not sure the technology is quite up to the task yet. Uh, it's the case that we've actually outsourced the first 100 of these genomes to the Beijing Genomics Institute. But what you can see here are some of the uh, requirements, the criteria for uh, inclusion of DNA samples in this genome 10 k project. They concern uh, detailed information on uh, data on voucher specimens, uh, 
uh, having redundant samples. And so this is, I think, a, an important way in which uh, museum scientists can make sure to put the brakes on genome projects, which can sometimes run amok without considering the issues of uh, data retrieval and archiving. I'm reminded of a talk I once heard by Monty Slatkin in which he was trying to understand the population genomics of chimpanzees, uh, which, whose genome had been sequenced to the tune of $15 million. Now, this genome was based on a zoo animal whose providence and whose geographic origin was unknown. And it turned out that we, Monty needed to know the subspecies and the location from which that genome was sequenced. And this is the type of information that, the type of loss of information that really shouldn't happen and where, uh, where zoologists can play an important role. So I'll now segue into uh, a topic that's near and dear to my heart, which is Australian phylogeography. And I'll try to illustrate for you uh, some of the, what, the transitions of the field that is, uh, genomics is bringing on. Here's just a list of some of the uh, expeditions we've been on over the years. It looks pretty much like a, a Rorschach's test. Uh, there is some method to this madness. Uh, you can see that our expeditions have gotten uh, incrementally, incrementally smaller as my family group has gotten larger. Um, but um, it's been a wonderful run. We've got a huge backlog of samples now, and so we've slowed down somewhat on direct field work. But um, it's a great system, and of course, as great as the biota down there are the Australians themselves. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is a slide that Craig has seen a number of times. So thank you so much for chuckling yet again. <laughs> but um, it's a long-term project, which of course started with my dissertation right here. And this was, of course, looking at the phylogeography of a very interesting species called the gray-crowned babbler. Um, these are some of the sampling sites. Um, this is the mitochondrial gene tree, which was sort of the piece de resistance of my dissertation. Um, mitochondrial DNA has had a, a wonderful impact on animal phylogeography. You can see in this example that the clades uncovered by mitochondrial DNA map extraordinarily well to the areas of endemism around the continent. You can see how there's a, a, a really good correspondence in the species perhaps because it's social and doesn't undergo long uh, dispersal events. There's a nice correspondence between the genes and geography. Now, this sort of paradigm uh, by which we sort of build trees and try to infer uh, geographic patterns and demographic patterns is, of course, where phylogeography started. It very much grew out of the paradigm laid down by Alan Wilson and Becky Kahn in their studies of human mitochondrial DNA. And so this is, of course, their landmark paper in Nature in 1987, in which they laid out the human evolutionary tree. Uh, this was a tour de force of looking at many individuals for a single locus, but nonetheless a locus that provided a lot of useful information on the demographic history. <clears throat> now contrast the picture that you see here, a somewhat complicated picture with upwards of 140 tips to the image that I'll show you now, which is a much more simplified view of human evolution. Here we have what you might call demographic models. These are models not of gene lineages, but of population lineages, population histories. Here we have not hundreds or thousands of tips, but perhaps five or six. Here we have a scenario where we have a single divergence event, perhaps a population expansion, perhaps even a hybridization event, as has been suggested by data on Neanderthals. A much simpler picture of history, because the focus, part of the focus, on, a part of the shift that has been brought on by genomic data, despite the fact that the data is vastly bigger than what was in the earlier era, the scenarios we're trying to envision and trying to estimate are simpler. And that's an intriguing dichotomy to me. We're no longer interested in hundreds of tips of gene trees, but we're focusing squarely on population histories. And of course, in our own field of zoology, uh, we're used to uh, thinking in this way to a certain extent. Many of the tools that we use, such as tools like migrate, have estimating migration rates between populations, uh, isolation migration, envisioning a divergence event with population size changes, uh, species trees, a set of divergence events, 
without any gene flow subsequent. These are all types of demographic models. Even phylogenetics I view as sort of a demographic model in the extreme. And yet, uh, this, so we have a diversity of tools that allows us to think about the complexities of multi-locus data. And we're still in that transition, but there's some very exciting uh, uh, trends occurring. I mean, uh, Rasmus here has been very uh, vociferous in defense of model-based phylogeography. Uh, new statistical techniques such as approximate Bayesian uh, computation. And so all of these are, uh, I would say, uh, nested in sort of a, a demographic history framework. <clears throat> so I'll talk about a couple of case studies. I won't go into detail on any of these, but these are all, uh, at least three of them are species that we've looked at across this uh, Carpenterian barrier. Uh, that's these uh, tree creepers and grass finches and redback wrens. Um, zebra finches represent a different demographic history, um, but are nonetheless uh, have, have some uh, really important lessons to teach us as we move into the genomic era. So here's again some sampling we've done on tree creepers as you can see geographically very concordant with what you saw for the babblers earlier. Now uh, we've uh, tried to uh, move aggressively into the era of multi-locus nuclear DNA sequencing and as you can see on this uh, next slide we've got a plethora of uh, rather complicated gene trees. Here in this case, the red lineages indicate the western blacktail lineage. The green lineages indicate the brown tree creeper lineage. As you can imagine, each locus has a, a different uh, topology and, and time frame. At least a few years ago, it was unclear how to merge all this data <laughs> together. What was also unclear was the extent to which phylogeography even needs to rely on gene trees as a, a tool. This is a hard transition to make because, of course, the field began with a focus squarely on gene trees, if not just mitochondrial gene trees. And so uh, the kinds of statistics and tools that we use uh, may well be moving away from an explicit focus on gene trees. And so, for example, take this data, which, again, looks complicated, where none of the loci show what we call reciprocal monophyly, wherein each set of alleles is, is distinct, we run it through a program such as structure and boom, marvelously and perhaps a suspiciously simple. Um, but again, it's, it's this, uh, I, I believe strongly that um, phylogeographers can, be, uh, can lose the forest for the trees. We can uh, become overly focused on the details of gene trees and lose, our, lose sight of the population lineages. Now, if we, uh, we've applied this multi-locus approach to a number of different species, and this just shows sort of a comparative uh, look at divergence times and population sizes in the uh, grass finches, the red-backed wrens, both of which are distributed across that Carpenterian barrier in the north, uh, and uh, the uh, zebra finches, which are a much more inland uh, arid continental species. And uh, we can Again, I want to just emphasize the simplicity of these demographic scenarios. We here, see here a sort of a phylogenetic pattern, another phylogenetic pattern perhaps accompanied by gene flow in the red back reds, and the zebra finch wherein we have a continental population and an island population, which I'll talk a little bit more about later, which shows clear evidence of having undergone <coughs> a bottleneck and a very dramatic population expansion. This is the type of uh, comparative phylogeography that I think the field is moving uh, towards. Another type of high resolution approach to phylogeography comes with sort of using uh, sequence data to geolocate individuals. So uh, this has been demonstrated marvelous, marvelously in human population genetics. And so this figure may be familiar to many of you as a principal components analysis of about 250,000 SNPs that were genotyped in several thousand individuals from Europe. And uh, what uh, John Novambra showed, he's uh, a, um, a, a graduate of this department and now at UCLA, was that the positions of these populations in principal component space had a remarkable concordance with the geographic locations in real space. And you can see here that the map of Europe is visible 
uh, in the principal components analysis. Remember, this analysis is not informed by geography at all. It's simply placing the individual points in a, a, a multi-dimensional space. And what's remarkable is the concordance with the actual map of Europe. And what this told John was that this uh, suggests a certain set of models of demographic history, uh, wherein perhaps there was um, a stepping stone uh, approach. And so uh, there's a very active field of inquiry now to ask, what can the correspondence between points in principal component space and in geographic space tell us about the uh, demographic processes leading to those populations? We've had a chance to look at this on a much smaller scale in our tree creeper system, wherein uh, we've sampled populations, again, around the periphery of Australia. And what you can see here is a principal components plot of uh, both species, which has been sort of reoriented to uh, correspond as best as possible to the geographic locations. And what was intriguing to me is that, for example, populations uh, here sampled from Newman, which is a, a location in the Pilbara in Western Australia, fall into the lower left of the plot. We can move up the principal components axis as if we're traveling across the uh, transect here to the north. We can then move across to the east coast, looking at birds in green here from Weepa, which is a uh, locality in Cape York. We can then move uh, down the plot along PCA axis two and eventually make our way to populations in South Australia. So in a very small way, you see Again, in this study, a correspondence between uh, principal component space and geographic <coughs> space. And I think this is quite intriguing and tells us perhaps that the ev evolution of these populations has been one that didn't involve a lot of uh, reorganizations. For example, reorganizations driven by glaciers or dramatic uh, dispersal events. <coughs> And we are following uh, Craig's lead very much, and, and the lead of many of you here, trying to incorporate a landscape view into these uh, studies, looking, for example, at uh, areas of climatic stability in different species, as has been uh, demonstrated so well here. This is, these are plots done by uh, Susan Cameron, which of course, who, of course, was a, a product partly of MBZ and did, ended up doing a postdoc with me through the Harvard Center for the Environment. But uh, areas of stability are going to be an intriguing uh, aspect, I think, of this study across the uh, monsoon tropics because my hunch, and uh, we can, it'd be great to discuss this, is that uh, the um, imprint of areas of stability will be a lot less in this uh, much more open habitat, one where the ecological gradients are somewhat more uh, broad, less extreme than the uh, wet tropics system that uh, Craig and others have studied in such detail. We've also begun to look at um, niche patterns as uh, evidenced by the extraordinary databases available in um, the avian breeding bird atlases. Again, this is work by Susan Cameron showing that we can take uh, the often thousands of observations of breeding birds for any given species, such as hairy woodpeckers or black-headed grosbeaks, um, do niche projections and put these uh, back in time. So for example, these are projections during the glacial maximum. Uh, we can relate these to current uh, distributions and marry these as best as possible to the signals we're getting from genetics. This is ongoing work uh, in collaboration with uh, Garth Spellman. Um, but we're very excited to assemble a data set, a multi-locus data set of multiple species uh, with um, detailed uh, niche reconstructions to see how well, they map onto each other. Now, a species that is uh, allowing us, I think, to look uh, in exciting ways at the connections between genomics and geography is the Anolis lizard, which, of course, uh, whose genome was recently published in Nature. And we can use it now as a platform to ask about the relationship between variables such as gene expression and climatic variables. So what you see here is some work by my graduate student, Shane campbell Staten, who um, has developed a simple mitochondrial phylogeo phylogeographic hypothesis. In this example, we see um, sort of uh, central Florida being sort of the source from which uh, more northerly and westerly populations of Anolis have spread. And so you can see, for example, this Gulf Coast clade, a very shallow clade 
presumably providing a signature of a population expansion. Uh, and this providing a much needed uh, baseline, a geographic foundation, with which to interpret the main uh, aspect of his study, which is uh, gene expression. <clears throat> and this shows for some of the climatic regimes that he's been able to characterize in uh, two areas where we've now sampled populations for look, uh, examination of gene expression. So uh, this is a very early part of the study. It's by no means complete. But he sampled uh, two populations in each of these areas in central Florida and North Carolina, which differ strongly in uh, uh, aridity and in temperature. And we have undergone uh, uh, Illumina sequencing of liver transcriptomes, where we've um, compared essentially pooled populations in these northern and southern uh, uh, populations to see if we can find allele frequency differences. And so this is his distillation of a, a huge amount of data that you can see detailed here, looking at the top 50 genes in turn ranked according to their extent of gene expression difference in North Carolina and Florida. And what you can see are uh, some intriguing and at this point very speculative uh, examples of genes which show a high level of, of expression difference between these <coughs> populations. Some of these we can uh, <clears throat> begin to suspect might have roles in uh, metabolism or perhaps in water transport, such as this desaturase, which is involved with the extent to which cell walls take on water, might be underlying some of the adaptations that are presumed to occur in living in a more humid or more uh, uh, xeric environment. So um, there's a lot of more work to do on this study, but I think it illustrates um, uh, some exciting ways in which we can use gene expression as a phenotypic uh, marker to uh, lay across geography. Let's talk a little bit about what the future might bring. <clears throat> there's a huge and growing body of literature uh, looking at this practice of what we call association mapping. This is basically taking uh, whole uh, genome sequences or in some cases, uh, maps developed by a few markers, and asking where one finds strong associations between genomic variation and phenotypic variation. Uh, these are all very exciting projects. Most of them have uh, been leveraged off fully sequenced genomes already. And yet I suggest that most of the species that folks are working on in this room will be at this stage before we know it. And I think what's important is to poise ourselves so that we can take advantage of this situation. One example which is intriguing to me, um, and again, I might uh, <clears throat> pick on my uh, former undergraduate, Elaine, since I've heard a lot about her project during my visit here, is the potential for genes to influence, for example, the gut microbiota. We're all interested in the genes underlying phenotypic traits, even if that goal seems distant for many of the species that uh, we're studying. I think it's fair to say that we should be poising ourselves to take advantage of making those connections now. And so, for example, imagine if you could think of the gut microbiota, and Rory, forgive me for uh, sort of providing some unsolicited advice to your student, uh, Elaine, <laughs> but imagine thinking of the gut microbiota as a quantitative trait that varies across individuals, across landscapes, uh, we have a, an interesting system perhaps where you have an unstructured population from a single location that shows variation in this trait. Whole genome sequencing will allow us to at least make suggestions about which genes might be influencing the gut microbiota and therefore might be influencing a lot of downscape, down, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, of traits uh, downstream that might be in turn influenced by this community. So linking genotype and phenotype will certainly be challenging for a lot of these continuously varying traits. But that's where association mapping comes in and that's where large series of individuals appropriately sampled both geographically and genomically can really provide some exciting insights. <clears throat> now the system that we've been working on in zebrafinches I think illustrates a little bit what we can hope to see in this new era. And as in commerce, so in genomics, it's all about location, location, location. <laughs> and by that I mean knowing the genomic location of markers can 
tell us a lot of information. Most of us have done phylogeography without any knowledge of the genomic location of the markers in terms of where they are on the chromosomes. In this study, we took advantage of a partially sequenced zebra finch genome to develop these so-called locus trios, which uh, are spaced at uh, known distances. So for example, two kilobases in this case, 10 kilobases in this case. We've sampled a modest number of individuals. We know the species is largely unstructured. And so uh, in, we reason that it wasn't worth investing in hundreds of individuals in this case. Our question here was to look at levels of linkage disequilibrium. How congealed is the genome, and how independently evolving are different loci in the genome? <clears throat> this is important because an understanding of, of, of demography is going to be critical to understand how we should sample populations for association studies. Should we sample a lot of individuals? Should we sample them all in one place? Should we do exome capturing versus whole genome sequencing? All of these decisions rest critically on the demographic history of populations. Just to remind you again, we're talking about a species that is found both on the uh, Australian mainland as well as on uh, the Lesser Sunda Islands. And uh, the demographic history that we <coughs> reconstructed using uh, multiple loci showed a clear evidence of a bottleneck in the founding of that island population about 1.8 million years ago. Um, the continental population has subsequently expanded to a remarkably big effective population size. There's probably tens of millions, if not billions, of these birds <laughs> in Australia uh, in terms of census size. But the island population has remained relatively small, and its growth has been modest. Now, if we look at linkage disequilibrium between one of these locus trios, here's one locus here, another one separated by 2 kb, and another by 10 kb. This is in the continental population. You can see there's virtually no disequilibrium. And of course, disequilibrium is the association of different SNPs to one another. How concordant are the patterns of genetic variation between pairs of SNPs? This type of diagram where one sees sporadic significant associations, many of which may be simply uh, the result of uh, multiple testing, suggests that there's very little disequilibrium in this population. It's got a very fluid genome, which means that association mapping is going to be tough. It's going to, we're going to have to get fairly close use a marker fairly close to the target gene to actually hunt it down. This might be a situation where exon capturing may not work. Who knows? It depends a lot on the demographic history and the intrinsic rate of recombination, which we actually know is, can be quite high in birds. Now let's look at the uh, island population, and you can see that there are large and substantial blocks of linkage disequilibrium presumably driven by the bottleneck that it underwent through when it founded the uh, Lesser Sunda Islands. <clears throat> this is a situation which is also challenging because uh, we may have huge blocks of sequences along haplotypes that travel together, where you could find a marker that's uh, a megabase away from the target gene and not be able to discriminate that from other genes in the intervening space. So this is just an example of the way in which demographic history can inform uh, how we might want to interrogate species like this in an association study. And the human geneticists deal with this exactly the same issues, albeit with much uh, larger sample sizes and resources. Okay, I want to end on an interesting <coughs> uh, study in which we've again used transcriptomics, and then I'll simply segue uh, to a conclusion. This is a study done by my, my student, June Lee, uh, who uh, very without fear, perhaps somewhat naively, but without fear, jumped into the evolutionary genetics of a very iconic group and highly uh, competitive group, shall we say, of Australian passerines known as fairy wrens. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, many of you are probably familiar with these uh, great birds. They're uh, highly dimorphic in some clades, uh, very cryptic in other clades, such as these uh, emu wrens and grass wrens. Um, June was interested in <clears throat> the playoff between sexual selection and molecular evolution. Could he find evidence for natural selection or sexual selection in the genome? He did this by first undertaking a multi-locus study 
using what are presumably neutral markers. These are housekeeping genes. Uh, they may be some introns or anonymous loci. This slide simply shows that, <clears throat> in his case, the gene tree, uh, the optimal gene tree for each gene, <clears throat> was different for every marker. Every marker was telling a slightly different story. And to us, this suggests that there was a lot of incomplete lineage sorting, <clears throat> a lot of retention of <clears throat> excuse me, ancestral polymorphisms, which, of course, is what we would expect for a rapidly diverging clade for a neutral loci. Now, we used uh, species tree methods to look at a phylogeny. I don't want to dwell too much on this, but suffice it to say that, as many of you know, we have robust methods now to take to accommodate this heterogeneity. <clears throat> now, I've been thinking a lot about uh, the effects of natural selection on phylogenetic and population genetic processes. And of course, the shining example of this is work by Chung Yi Wu on Drosophila for the Odysseus gene, which uh, dramatically showed, was involved with speciation, involved with hybrid breakdown, and dramatically showed a situation where, where neutral genes showed a very heterogeneous pattern of incomplete lineage sorting. Odysseus showed uh, lots of fixations between species, presumably driven by natural selection. So there are clear phylogenetic predictions for genes under natural selection. We also know that there are population genetic signatures. For example, in the population sizes that we estimate for species at particular loci, we expect them to show a reduction in genetic diversity if they are under natural selection. And so uh, June was in a good position to test <coughs> these ideas. <coughs> so we, uh, again, focused on fairy wrens because of their extraordinary uh, mating systems and evidence for sperm competition. And what you can see here is an uh, estimate of the number of uh, sperm per gram of body weight. Uh, these guys are off the charts. They have more sperm per gram of body weight than any bird measured to date. Um, presumably driven by the uh, lots of extra pair copulations and compl complex mating systems in this species. Now, um, we went to Australia with the idea of uh, assembling uh, genomic resources such that we could interrogate the transcripts occurring in the gonads of males and breeding males and females. This, we thought, would be the locus of natural selection, uh, especially if sperm competition is high. Now, naturally, I got distracted. Uh, there were people chasing us all over the place. June and my postdoc, Chris, spent a lot of time doing uh, you know, bench work. This, it turns out, was uh, the, uh, these were the cameramen that put together the wonderful video on Alan Wilson uh, a few years ago. And they uh, basically tagged along. And we, uh, I don't say wasted a lot of time. I think PR is an important thing, that, important game to play. We've got to get our scientific stories out there. And so um, it's important to embrace those opportunities when appropriate. But we soon got to business. Uh, sampling birds, and here's a picture of the gonads of a breeding season red-backed wren. The gonads comprise a full 10% of its body weight. <laughs> now, initially, I thought that grinding these gonads up would really end up with a long laundry list of sort of housekeeping genes, genes involved with uh, cell proliferation, tissue uh, generation, etc. We used 454 to uh, sequence cDNAs from breeding season and non-breeding season gonads. To cut to the chase, our results looked like this. We found upwards of 10,000 contigs in the breeding season gonads, a little over 2,000 in the uh, non-breeding season gonads. Mm -hmm. Intriguingly, we found a number of transcripts specific to the breeding season a number of transcripts specific to the non-breeding season, and a number that were common to both uh, physiological states. If we look at the uh, laundry list of the top 20 genes in terms of their overall expression levels, we find a number of really interesting genes, many of which are involved with sperm production and deployment. So for example, we see proacrosin. We see uh, a number of genes involved with uh, beta defensins, and a number of genes whose identity is unknown. These are these blue categories. These are genes which I'm particularly excited to follow up on because we don't know what they do. And understanding their evolutionary patterns might give us some insight. 
you can see here the coverage over here. Some of these are, are very uh, highly expressed, but all of these genes have, uh, have good solid coverage of at least six-fold. Now, what we did was to um, look at uh, the uh, phylogeny of these genes in a subset of the fairy wrens. This is a tight-knit group, uh, especially this red-backed and white-winged wrens that are very closely related. Neutral genes invariably show incomplete lineage sorting, so there's a lot of rapid speciation going on. <clears throat> now, June had showed in his earlier chapters that at many different levels among populations, between closely related species, and even at the family level in these birds, this is a paper coming out of systematic biology, that there was a lot of incomplete lineage sorting. There was a lot of shared polymorphisms. And what was intriguing to find that when we looked at the phylogeny of the genes expressed in testes, we found either a reduced level of incomplete lineage sorting for genes that by other criteria showed, uh, didn't show evidence of natural selection, and among genes that showed high levels of adaptation as judged by uh, PAML scores, looking at non-synonymous and synonymous mutations, showed no evidence of incomplete lineage sorting. This, we suggest, is evidence of the type seen at loci like Odysseus that have been driven to fixation in different species by natural or sexual selection. Here's uh, some examples of those genes, proacrosin and outer defense, dense fiber protein. Our sample sizes are somewhat small, and this is a concern. But we can show, using various statistical tests, that the probability of achieving this sort of reciprocal mon monophyly by chance, especially among four species, is extremely small. <clears throat> now we've also, just to uh, end up, we've done a couple interesting um, exercises on this data set using a new uh, Bayesian um, uh, program, which is uh, mostly used for species delimitation. Uh, this is Ziheng Yang's uh, BPP method. And I know this is of great interest here in the MVZ because, um, well, several graduates, Matt Fujita and Adam Lieche, have um, sort of ushered this method into the, uh, into the uh, zoology literature. And there's an exciting review paper uh, that's uh, in submission. In this model, what we can do is to look at, uh, on a locus by locus basis, the patterns not only of divergence between species, but the amount of polymorphism within species. So in this sort of uh, basic model, we can measure this parameter theta, which of course is an index of population size. Um, and we can measure divergence time as measured in mutations. This is a measure of the speed with which genes are uh, diverging, sort of a substitution rate. Now this might be, for example, a neutral gene. Imagine we uh, crank it up and add some natural selection. What we'll see is a reduction of population size, these, these branches of gotten a, a little bit narrower. <clears throat> and we might also see an acceleration of substitution rate. So don't get bogged down in the <laughs> equations. We want to pay attention to two uh, variables, this so-called heredity scalar, H, which is essentially a measure of the reduction in effective population size on a per locus basis. We expect this to go down if a gene is under natural selection. The other variable is this rate R, which is a measure of the between species divergence, and we expect that to go up if genes are under natural selection. This uh, rate scalar applies both to theta and to the divergence time, whereas the uh, heredity scalar only applies to uh, effective population size. So if we look at the pattern of first R, so this is the rate of evolution estimated, not only for uh, uh, genes in the transcriptome study, but for other genes that uh, June looked at in uh, earlier aspects of his thesis. What's extraordinary is that the transcript genes show some of the highest rates of evolution, despite the fact that they're coding regions. These coding regions are showing higher estimates of rate than many of these blue bars, which are non-coding DNA. And this is exciting because it suggests that natural or sexual selection might be driving them uh, ever faster. Let's now look not at the rate between species, but at the uh, polymorphism within species as measured by that H heredity scalar. What you can see is now the, the testes transcripts are now at the other end of the distribution. They are all showing heredity scalars and extensive diversity that are substantially smaller than uh, the other, other categories of genes. And so 
This could be taken as locus specific evidence for reductions in population size driven perhaps by natural selection. So we're very much in the process of still analyzing this data. Um, Zihang Yang modified the program somewhat so we could look at these statistics. But we're intrigued by what seem to be really interesting signals for natural selection and sexual selection in this data set. So I just want to end on a few uh, notes of other uh, values that I bring to um, leadership positions that I've been in. I very much value inclusiveness and bringing diverse student groups into the fold of the museum world. I think museums and collections are great places to turn students on to uh, zoological science, and to head them on to careers, if not in academia, then into careers in equally important areas of government or, uh, or research. <clears throat> and so, for example, one of the recent uh, uh, activities that I undertook as president of the American Genetics Association, these guys publish the Journal of Heredity, which is a, a really exciting journal. And uh, as president, I was charged with organizing the uh, annual meeting. Uh, and I chose to hold the meeting in Mexico, despite the fact that in its over 100 year history, the society had only held the meeting outside of US once, and that was in Canada. <laughs> now, uh, needless to say, there was a little bit of skepticism about the success of a meeting in Mexico. I mean, many of the suggestions were that, well, we wouldn't get you know, US students to come. We would, the meeting would be small and expensive. Um, in collaboration with a lot of other people, we were able to put together some NSF funds and to uh, have what I think turned out to be a really spectacular meeting at this institution, which is the National Laboratory of Genomics and Biodiversity in Irapuato, Mexico. It's about three hours north of Mexico City. We had a wonderful uh, day-long symposium there in which we had tours of this institution. They are hiring top-notch scientists. I've encouraged uh, my own lab group to consider applying for some of these positions. Um, after a day here, we moved to the really stunning town of Guanajuato. And my motivation for doing this was to really increase the dialogue between US scientists and scientists from Latin America. Um, I certainly had never been to this national laboratory, and yet I had heard that it was uh, a remarkable facility. And I felt that, uh, if anything, US scientists would benefit by seeing uh, this uh, remarkable institution. And so I'm really uh, pleased with that effort to try to bring together scientists, graduate students, postdocs, who might not have ever uh, had a chance to meet their colleagues from uh, Mexico. And we proceeded the symposium with a, a, a workshop which uh, had contributions, well, participation by several people here, including Rasmus Nielsen, who gave a really wonderful uh, module in our Next Gen Sequencing Workshop. I've also, as many of you know, been very um, passionate about uh, increasing diversity within uh, evolutionary biology. Uh, I've run a very small but um, enthusiastic program bringing undergraduates to the evolution meetings uh, every year. And it's really a pleasure to acknowledge uh, the MBZ community. Um, Craig has always been a really big supporter of this program. And it's, in a small way, uh, a, a contribution, I hope, that can facilitate the entry of uh, these usually very talented students into an area that can seem sometimes very intimidating. I think uh, we all have to work on our, uh, our, our, our prowess as mentors, perhaps dealing with students uh, of very different backgrounds than we brought, than we brought with us. And um, the level of excitement for this type of activity here has certainly uh, energized me. <clears throat> so I'd like to thank, this is a, a hugely uh, uh, uncomplete, incomplete list of all the people who have gone with these studies. But suffice it to say that I will look forward to seeing, hopefully, many of you at uh, the SACNIS meetings in a few weeks, <laughs> right in Sandy and San Jose. So thank you very much. Some people need to get the classes at once, so if you do, please. But otherwise, please stay, and uh, we'll take some questions. Okay, so let's uh, start Roy. I thought I'd be done anything with ovaries. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, no, we, we do have ovaries, but we haven't put them. I mean, we're careful not to say uh, male-specific genes, because we don't know if they're specific. But, um, you know, in some ways, you might predict um, a number of in interesting antagonistic interactions going on in the ovaries as well. It's something on the to-do list. Well, I have one more little thing. So, Scott, you, I know you're keen on uh, thinking about how we can use museum collections going forward to enhance sort of genomics or tie in genomics in with phenotype studies and so on. So, how, you, have, you know how we do our work. How should we change our practices or the opportunities for museum scientists? Uh. <laughs> tell us how to do Can we save this for a few weeks from now? Um, but no, I think, you know, and you guys are doing a lot of uh, some of the I think uh, exciting approaches already. I think, um, you know, one thing that we often do when we're in the field is we'll record um, the time between sacrifice of an animal and the time into the, the nung tube. And this is an important variable for downstream studies because, um, you know, it's that time that, of course, uh, winnows down the number of uses to which those tissues can be put. And the difference between, say, um, you know, uh, five minutes or ten minutes and you know, an hour can sometimes to potentially mean the difference between being able to look at gene expression or not. And so, um, you know, I think a lot of museums are beginning to do this in a focused way. It's not a, an easy thing to do in many field situations, but I think it's something that might be uh, interesting to look at on targeted species that are um, common and, and easily encountered. Um, I mean, another thing is to um, uh, think about the um, 